everyone. We're going to begin with the proceedings for the day just to keep everything on time. So thank you so much for being here. And I just wanted to welcome everyone and to Synapse's like, inaugural research event called Resilient Brain, Mapping the Landscape of TBI Research. And I would like to thank my team. So I'm Sharik Jamani and I'm the founder of the club. But I would like to thank my team for putting together this event and like this could not have been done without them. So thank you so much everyone for coming together and like celebrating their success and like putting together this event for the TBI community and for everyone at all that that is behind here today. Thank you. So I'm excited to share Synapse's journey very briefly with you and how the group, group has kind of grown its roots not just at Columbia but in New York City as well and that is the goal to operate at scale in New York City and not just localize our impact to Columbia University only. And so our goals have been to cultivate community, but also to raise awareness about what traumatic brain injury is and what concussions are as well. For example, they form within, they fall within the same umbrella, but they're often like talked about very separately. But so, and like Dr. Noble and Dr. Perny and Dr. Oberlin will speak about that like soon. And also, I was super excited to share that we were featured in the New York Times recently. So that was one of our major successes. And I'm really, really happy that everyone is here today to just kind of like commemorate this event and like following that like success that we had. So like moving on to today's event, without further ado, so we had the privilege of hosting some amazing speakers who are trailblazers in the field of clinical research and neuroscience research in traumatic brain injury and concussions. And we had the pleasure of hosting Dr. Oberlin from Wild Cornell, and Dr. Noble from Columbia University Medical Center, and Dr. Kearney from Columbia Medical Center as well. And the event will begin with each of the speakers like presenting like a high-level overview because their research is super detailed, but just given the time constraints, like it'll be a pretty high-level overview of what the research is about. And then we'll transition into a moderating session led by our wonderful vice president, Kayla Kaplan, over there. And then we'll transition to a Q&A session where anyone who does want to speak personally to the researchers and doctors, they can do so after the event, but they're also free to ask any questions that they do have in the Q&A session as well. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Noble to start off the event. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank the organizers for uh, bringing this together for us. Um, I'm just going to step away from the screen so you guys can all see it. So my name is uh, Dr. Noble. I'm a neurologist up at Columbia Medical Center. I've been there since 2002, and in 2003, I met uh, my first athlete at Columbia University, and I was really inspired uh, by the story that I heard, and it's really gotten me to uh, you know, uh, pursue this line of work and get to where we are today. So today I'm going to be covering, really focusing on what we're doing around sports-related concussion at Columbia as well as in, within the Ivy League, and uh, trying to figure out how that can inform a lot of the best practices that we have at the collegiate level beyond our groups. Uh, my disclosure is the one that's most relevant here is something called No More Diagnostics, which actually developed uh, initially as a, as a project, a research project I did in collaboration with Barclay Morrison here. It's been spun out of the university into a startup that we're still working on the same line of work. And we'll talk about that just for briefly as, a, as an example of how you can transition from a research idea into something maybe that's um, both medically and commercially applicable. So here are some big unanswered questions in concussion. And just to be sure that we're talking about the same language, concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury, a traumatic brain injury, uh, but it's not the same as a lot of other forms of traumatic brain injury. It's a non-focal traumatic brain injury, but it's a, a diffuse traumatic brain injury and has different features from other forms of traumatic brain injury that you'll be hearing about later on. But concussion is something that we have tended to focus on in the field, in the field of sports. Uh, I'm not gonna cover its epidemiology beyond sports that much today, but just to say that Sports are not the only reason that concussions happen, and actually they're, min they're the minority of, of, of uh, concussion contexts. Most other people have concussion in the context of things like traumatic brain injury from car accidents and falls and so forth, and about maybe one out of every five concussions in the, in the adolescent uh, period is related to a sports-related concussion. But it offers us an opportunity, a window, into seeing a very specific group of individuals who are often followed very closely over time and it offers us some uh, windows of opportunity for research. But we still are only beginning to answer questions about how often it occurs in sports and in general. What are some individual uh, specific risks for concussion down to the player or sex specific uh, risks in sports? When do they begin? What are the periods of greatest risk and how do they inform long-term practices? Who gets recurrent concussions and why? And why do some uh, athletes that we see into their 20s and 30s never experience a traumatic brain injury, at least clinically, or even some that never face any kind of long-term outcomes after being exposed to frequent head impacts. 
can we create a personalized and expected recovery timeline based on what we know now, or what will it take to get us there? And what policies do we have that can actually make a uniform difference in sports or in a school? Now, ultimately, we wanna change practice and change culture based on some of the research that we have and not just have it live in isolation. And we're also interested in learning how much injury is too much for certain athletes in order for them to keep playing high-risk sports or for anyone else. And are there long-term outcomes and risks of concussion that we need to be aware of um, in youth athletes, collegiate athletes? Does it have to do with multiple or, or, um, or single injuries? And are there other neurological sequelae we need to be mindful of? And what are the treatment options aside from avoidance and prevention? So we made some headway on these first ones. But the reason we're here today is not because of those questions, but it's probably because of a few individuals. And just to make sure we're all talking the same language here, um, does anybody know who these people are on the, on the screen? Let's start with the, I don't know if my pointer works, but this guy right here, anybody know who this guy is? Or this guy here? Mike Webster, that's right. Who was Mike Webster? He was the center for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was the central figure in a, in a movie called Concussion and also the beginning of a book called League of Denial. And next to him is Terry Bradshaw, who many more may, might recognize. He does a lot of Sunday commentating on the NFL still. Those are both of them for Mike Webster's induction into the NFL Hall of Fame. So Terry Bradshaw still commentates on Sunday afternoon football. Mike Webster died at age 50 and became the index case of the first patient to be diagnosed with chronic traumatic encephalopathy who had played uh, uh, NFL football. The top right, I just show this as an individual reminder that you know there are people that I take care of uh, that are uh, not this individual particularly, but there are athletes around us who are um, exposed to head injury and forces that we need to be mindful of. Um, and also, I, I like this picture at the bottom right to tell us how, how far we've come. Does anybody know who's there on the ground? If you had to guess a player from baseball, who would that be? Babe Ruth. That's Babe Ruth, exactly, well done. So 1924, Babe Ruth runs into the right field wall in Washington, he gets knocked out cold. And the difference between Babe Ruth's care now uh, versus what he had then is that he was dusted off, sent back onto the field and finished that game and then played the second game of a doubleheader. He played the next day too and hit a home run. Nowadays, that person would have been removed from play and put through a return to play protocol. And then the other thing to think about is this is not all about football, not all about baseball, and not necessarily about concussions, but other forms of neural injury. Does anybody know who that individual is? That's Lou Gehrig, that's right. So Lou Gehrig was a football player here at Columbia. Uh, he was a multi-sport athlete, was uh, seen hitting a very long drive in the, uh, in the baseball field and was recruited by the Yankees, I believe as a junior in college. But he, there are reports in the Columbia Spectator of him having concussions way back in the 1920s, a highly unusual thing to report upon back then. So right now, how do we diagnose concussion? This is really the organized sports model where we have a baseline assessment where people will take an in, intake evaluation, either pencil and paper based assessment or computerized assessment, and then one of two things happens. Uh, an injury occurs that's either spotted by somebody on the sideline or in the, uh, in the skybox. This is our, actually um, one of our athletic trainers who, who's a spotter at an NFL game. Uh, or uh, there have been some efforts to change this to accelerometry as a helmet-based metric. And then afterwards, an evaluation is done again, oftentimes the same evaluation. And the same individuals who are responsible for spotting those individuals are then the ones doing the evaluations on the sidelines. Um, the, if, if not for these two pathways, then the, the individual who's injured volunteers that they may have been injured. But a lot of the symptoms that we have in traumatic brain injury can be easily confused with things like dehydration, fatigue, or just getting hit hard in other parts of the body. Here are the kind of uh, the deformational changes that we see in traumatic brain injury. And to give you some orientation here, the bright red color would be the white matter, and the bright blue color is the gray matter of the brain. And this would be an example of a force of a punch coming to the, from the right side of the image, and it actually twists um, more preferentially earlier uh, the outside of the brain rather than the deep uh, white matter structures, the red parts of the brain first. So there's a conformational, deformation, deformational uh, change in the brain in response to force. Some of these images that you'll see where the brain is rattling around inside of the skull are completely wrong. Um, this is really a deformational challenge, uh, change uh, uh, in response to these forces, and there are different shearing forces that, are, that evolve, and there are different tensile strengths, tensile forces that you'll see, depending on the, the, the structural components of the gray matter versus white matter, for instance, or even where those margins may be. So these are courtesy of my colleague, uh, Dr. Mark, uh, Mark McMorrison, these are some finite element models that he's generated in his lab. Um, concussion pathophysiology is broadly described as we see it here at the right, which is basically a transient ionic change followed by uh, the changes in 
um, uh, more longer standing uh, uh, ionic changes and even changes in cerebral blood flow and blood volume. Well, clinically what we see is that there is either a direct or indirect force to the head with rapid onset of short-lived neurological problems, doesn't have to have loss of consciousness, and in fact only about 10 to 15 percent of patients with concussion have loss of consciousness. And it, the symptoms tend to be, um, uh, can be uh, delayed or can evolve, but most often what we see is that the the first symptoms that somebody has are the most apparent ones that somebody has are the last ones to resolve. They have no structural changes on conventional neuroimaging, and they follow this graded set of clinical symptoms, as I mentioned. Um, but some symptoms may persist, and a lot of our patients that we see may have uh, lingering symptoms, and, and it's not even that they have you know, one specific problem they can put their finger on, it's that they just don't quite feel 100%. That's something that's common with other traumatic brain injuries, too. To cover what we've been doing here at Columbia, a lot of this precedes my, my time uh, even arriving here. So uh, way back in 1983 was the first study um, trying to describe actually the symptomatology associated with football-related concussions. Uh, Columbia was one of 10 universities participating in a study that came out of, of Virginia, um, and they ended up studying about 2,500 football players specifically with 200 of those injured and followed over time. The final report, I don't think ever came out about that, but it was really just more of an intent as I understand, of describing the symptomatology and, and the frequency of those. Um, in the 1990s, there was something that was called the concussion, uh, Head Minor Concussion Resolution Index. As much as we've heard about the IMPACT program, this actually preceded the IMPACT program by a few years. The first publication came out in 2001. So this was really the first automated neuropsychological test for diagnosing concussion. And in 2001, that became the standard of care for all of our patients, all of our athletes, uh, beginning with football, and then sequentially we added other contact sports as time went on. In 2013, we published our first um, retrospective review of those data, looking at all football players. And what we found, this was presented at the American Neurological Association in 2013. What we found is that even when athletes are symptomatically recovered, they were still having obvious neuropsychological deficits uh, on their testing. Um, and really, the way that we practice is that somebody has to both be symptomatically and objectively cleared before they're put back on the field. This is a follow-up study that we did. This is all Columbia athletes who were involved in the Headminder Resolution uh, Program published in the Journal of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery in 2017. 1,200 uh, athletes ended up having 228 concussions. And the point of this graphic is to get, show you the relative symptom frequency of concussion. Um, it looks a lot like migraine. If you were to not know that you, if you're just walking in now and thinking you might be in a migraine lecture, that's because a lot of these symptoms look a whole lot like migraine. We see a lot of overlapping both pathophysiology and clinical symptoms, um, although obviously on a very different time scale. The one difference that we saw between men and women was that uh, women were more likely to complain of sleep issues and men were more, li more likely to complain of memory issues, and this has been seen actually in other studies too. The whole point of identifying concussion is so that we can remove somebody from play so that we can avoid future injury, both cognitive or brain injury as well as orthopedic injury because we know that the highest risk factor for having another concussion is having one recently or having one before. So no athletes are returned to play on the day of a concussive injury. This is uh, standardized across all sports in all states, all levels, and really uh, they have to be cleared by a licensed professional in order to go back to uh, the sport. They have to be asymptomatic and off medications, including medications that are naturoceuticals or vitamins that might be used from the treatment of things like migraine. We usually begin with a period of relative rest beginning with exercise shortly thereafter, but we have relatively sparse data for the long-term treatment plans. But we do have a, a graduate return to play protocol such that somebody has to uh, progress through one step before they're put to the next. And for students, the most important thing is that we don't return them into to sport until they've fully been cleared for their academic performance. This is the case for both the pediatric and the, uh, um, <clears throat> the young adult population in, in college. So return to learn, that's the RTL, has been a, a, a central focus. The whole reason that we remove athletes from the, uh, from the day of injury is because of this syndrome, which is rare, but it's been described and radiographically shown quite clearly, something called second impact syndrome. Probably on the order of dozens of cases have ever occurred, and interestingly, they've only occurred in adolescent males. They've never occurred in women, so far as I know, and never in older or uh, younger individuals. So what we see here in this case was somebody who had a concussion, was symptomatic with a headache. You see their head CT initially, they, had a head, they went back uh, and began to pl uh, play football. Four days uh, later, um, we did not disclose that they had not been cleared, and then had another traumatic brain injury with mild, uh, small uh, subdurals that you can see, the subdural hematomas, but also had diffuse uh, evidence of diffuse brain injury, maybe axonal injury too, and then four months afterwards had a significant uh, 
uh, uh, functional decline as evidenced by the uh, about two months later, and this has lasted beyond that. So we're trying to avoid that. The return to play strategies look like this. These are standard of care practices where we basically begin with athletes symptom limited activity followed by a lead aerobic exercise. These are stationary activities without any kind of head movement, which can often be very noxious for the athletes. Then sports specific exercises and training drills. And each one of these steps lasts no less than a day, oftentimes two or three days at a time before we uh, then uh, reassess them and clear them to go back to a sport. We looked at all collegiate athletes uh, with injury here, as I showed you before. And uh, interestingly, we found that among the men, before they even got to here, and, and keep in mind that this is a population enriched for football, we did have <clears throat> about 33% of all the male athletes in contact and collision sports before they got here had a high school concussion, whereas 26% of the women had had at least one uh, high school concussion. But that flipped, and we saw that actually women were much more likely to have a concussion after being an athlete here. Uh, so 17% of the men and 23% of the women. And this has been reflected in other studies too. Uh, our football-related rates of concussion over the course of a career here is about that 17%. That's lower than a lot of the other NCAA schools. Florida reported 26% of their athletes will have at least one concussion reported over time. Um, so the removal from play, uh, as I think we've covered this a little bit, and we have relative contraindications as well, and we've drilled into that a little further, but I think for the sake of time, I'll move on to the next point here. Um, we, we see that uh, on average athletes will return to play generally within about two to three weeks for the most part. Some factors that predict whether or not somebody's going to have a faster or shorter return to play can be a uh, relative amount of symptoms at, at the outset. So, But um, that's generally pretty consistent with what we see with other studies too. Encouragingly, in the last year there have been two studies suggesting that at early exercise is actually good for athletes rather than waiting it used to be the case that we would do something, not myself, but in prior uh, times we used to recommend uh, something called cocoon therapy or sensory deprivation therapy where basically people were put into their room, lights out, no exposure to anything, no activity, and that's been clearly found to be basically counterproductive and psychologically potentially harmful. I even have some patients who are worried that I'm going to tell them that that's what they ought to do. This study out of Buffalo suggested that those individuals who were randomized to early exercise had about a four day faster recovery period than those who were assigned to either no activity or stretching exercises. Um, interestingly, there was a retrospective paper just came out a few weeks ago suggesting this was not the case in a retrospective analysis. We have to wonder how people were followed or why people may have been recommended for one activity or another, but at least proactively it's positive. Um, other treatments that you'll often see recommended are vision therapy treatments, and I will just tell you my patients hate these. Um, because they're often asked, you know, sitting there looking at their thumbs or a post-it note in their dorm room or their home, and they could be out and about looking at street signs in New York City and probably feeling a bit more normal and doing the same thing for their uh, extraocular movement, movements. It, it may be really time spent with other individuals in a coached <coughs> atmosphere that makes people feel better, but we try to support people whether they have not just cognitive problems, visuospatial, visual, psychosocial support issues, especially as people who are young athletes and young students start to feel out of step with where they ought to be. Um, and young driven adults, the same kind of things uh, emerge. Uh, biomarkers are something that's become of great interest to us. We're thinking that if you can early identify a concussion uh, through biomarkers of any kind, it may reduce morbidity and the risk of re-injury, may also be able to provide prognostication in the short term and also begin to look at long-term outcomes. And I think if we can identify which biomarker would be the best candidate, whether it's an imaging or a fluid biomarker, we can really start to uh, pin down on personalized risk markers, somebody who may have a detectable versus a, a non-detectable injury, whether it's clinically evident or, or, or biomarker-based, and maybe even shifting these thresholds or th shifting these curves is something to look at. We know that the accelerometry, although it was very popular for a while, it really is very poor at identifying individual concussions, especially in high-risk sports like football, but it's probably pretty good for identifying a summative uh, uh, amount of exposure that somebody may have. And biomarkers right now kind of look like this. You'll hear about new tools, most of them landing in this bottom right category, where they go into, um, where they, they basically they're all locker room based uh, after the fact. Um, and the, the work that I'm doing right now is trying to put something on the field so that we can actually try to make a difference in, a, in detecting concussion in real time. Um, highlighted in bold on the right are all um, is a summary of all the different techniques that have been used at different timelines in the course of concussion recovery. Um, 
One thing that often comes up is maybe we could use PET scans in identifying acute or subacute injury, but I'll just say that's almost a non-starter most of the time just because you're dealing with a young athlete and irradiating them is a, is a bad idea, uh, or at least it's just a, hard to get any kind of uptake with a coaching staff or, or team. Uh, I'm interested in the acute phase and trying to improve our, our detection of diagnosis. And this is that team helmet thing I mentioned, NOMO. It's now called NOMO and Morris. So this is a name, clever name, we should have come up with a better one, but that's what we have anyways. Um, it's, an, it's a helmet-based uh, EEG, dry electrode EEG. The idea is that an athlete would wear it and you get a clear decision on the sideline as to whether or not somebody should continue. Still work in progress. Also works in progress, again, I mentioned what Columbia's history was when it comes to TBI um, uh, uh, research. There have been changes in policy and oftentimes the Ivy League leads the way. Um, you can see here that concussion education plans were mandated by the NCAA. We had one in place before this, but the Ivy League uh, went, went uh, Ivy League wide. The Ivy League was the first to eliminate two-a-day practices, where there basically there were two hit practices every day. This was through the NFL, did it in a collective bargaining agreement in uh, 2011. And then full contact practices, the uh, Ivy League led the way. And then there are no contact practices in season for the Ivy League now. And that's the only conference that does that. And the reason for that was because Buddy Tevens and Dartmouth came up with this thing, it was a robotic tackling dummy, which everybody laughed at him until he won the Ivy League championship, and everybody said, well, maybe we can do it too. So kind of cool. Um, behind the scenes, this is how it happens. So this is actually a photo from July in Chicago, where all of the uh, representatives from the Big Ten and the Ivy League, myself included, uh, we have epidemiologists, uh, heads of CDC injury prevention centers, athletic trainers, coaches, um, team physicians, neurologists, epidemiologists, all providing input on, on developing this, this care consortium. So this is uh, a 20 plus school consortium that we have developing, trying to improve the, the health and safety of our athletes. Um, I think I'll probably just leave it at this. Uh, I think our consortium offers opportunities, not just for managing our patients right now, but thinking about ways to <coughs> leverage large numbers in order to improve the health of these individuals long-term. We can't do this alone. The thing I learned from our Columbia study is that 15 years worth of data generates 200 plus concussions, and that actually doesn't tell us a whole lot. We need large data uh, sets in order to really change the culture and change what policies we need to make um, uh, at, a, at a granular level. I think that's it for me for the sake of time. I'll finish right there. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll have hold questions until the end, is that right? Yeah. So we're gonna have hold your question if you don't mind. Dr. Kearney is going to come up next. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I appreciate the invitation. I'm going to switch gears a little bit from what uh, Jamie talked about. Just to let you know my background, um, I'm, uh, I'm a pediatrician by training, and my interest, um, I, uh, I work only in the ICU, so I'm a, a pediatric intensivist. Um, and so my interest is really in severe brain injury, um, not necessarily the concussions that um, Jamie talked about. And what our lab does is really try to understand some of the mechanisms underlying the repair that happens after severe brain injuries. So many of you I know here are aware that you can sustain a really pretty awful injury um, that many people will say you won't recover from or you'll very minimally recover from. And um, oftentimes there's, um, whereas not complete recovery, there's a remarkable amount of endogenous <coughs> repair that occurs. And so that's what we're trying to understand, because the idea is if we can understand how endogenous repair works, um, then you think you could manipulate some of those pathways to kind of, to kind of get even better re repair to occur, is the idea. So um, um, even though I take care of children in the lab, we really just work with mice, and I want to make the point that what we really study is hippocampal behavior. So one of the um, kind of uniform things that's occur, that occurs after essentially all brain injuries is that the hippocampus is invariably injured. And the hippocampus is responsible for learning and memory. Um, the hippocampus in humans, you can see on the slide on the right, is very small and discreet, um, but is incredibly powerful in its ability to really um, 
uh, to really mediate the formation and the retention of a variety of different kinds of memory. In the mouse, what I'm going to talk about, the hippocampus is much more prominent. Genetically, um, it's essentially identical to the human hippocampus. It's kind of attached the same way, um, has the same kind of cells. And in rodents, you can imagine it's very important for spatial learning. Um, you know, uh, rodents have this ability to wander for miles and very far distances and food seeking behavior and somehow they can always find their way back home in a way that you and I can't. So they have a very robust ability, particularly around spatial memory. So we use it as a model um, to study memory and to study its effects on um, following TBI. Um, so how we got into this, this is a, this is a picture of a mouse brain. Um, and we first made this observation, it's, it's, it's been about 20 years now, um, when we did what we model as a focal um, injury, meaning we injured one side of the brain, and you can, I think everybody can hear, can recognize here on the left side of the brain there's an injury. That green staining you see is for astrocytes, which is one of the major cell types in the brain, and the orange is for neurons, um, it labels the neurons. If you'll notice on the, um, uh, injured side, the hippocampus that I just showed you, particularly that area um, in the middle, is kind of hypertrophied in spots. It kind of changes um, in a way that there's, the orange staining is really decreased on that injured side in most other spots. The interesting thing about that um, was that in that area, um, what's labeled the DG there, that's the dentate gyrus, and that's where um, and this was just recognized about 25 years ago that there's a stem cell population um, that's in everybody's brains that exists um, throughout life. When I was in medical school, um, which was before that, I was always taught that you're born with a certain number of neurons and then you just start losing them from the day you're born and it's all downhill. That's not <laughs> true. Um, and fortunately, medical students are learning differently now that we do have a, a couple areas in our brain where we continually repopulate um, with new neurons and it happens throughout the lifespan. The best studied and the most robust area where this comes is in the hippocampus, so in the dentate gyrus. And so we made this observation using techniques I won't talk about, but it looked like that in, the injury itself that we did to these mice actually activated these neural stem cells and caused them to proliferate within the hippocampus. And so we spent a lot of time trying to prove that, and how we did it is we made a, a variety of different kinds of mice that would, that would show us how that might happen. So one thing we did, you can see those green cells, we put in a, in a jellyfish protein called green fluorescent protein just in the stem cells, so we could see exactly where they are, and we could see what happens after injury. And so this just gives you um, a picture and an idea of what the cells look like. Um, they, they fluoresce like a jellyfish, but just those cells. And you can look at them under, under a microscope. And then when, you, um, when we made a mouse like this and we did an injury, you can see those green cells get very activated um, by the injury. And they migrate, they, they move, you get more of them, and they move to different areas. Um, so the idea was they are probably doing something First, we wanted to see, is this just a kind of a transient response? Does this just happen at the time of injury and then these cells kind of go away? Or do they actually incorporate into the brain and stably stay in the brain? And so to answer that question, we use some techniques I'm not gonna go into detail about because they're kind of boring, but um, what, it, what we showed is that actually at the time of injury, these cells proliferate, they incorporate into the brain and you can see two months after injury and six months after injury, if you see those cells that have migrated, they, they, they are permanently incorporated into the brain in a way that isn't what would have happened had they, you not been injured. So you get new neurons that are born because of the injury and they integrate in the brain forever. They stay there forever. So then the next question is, is that, you know, you could imagine good things about that. Um, you could also imagine bad things about that. So we developed this technique where we could just ablate those cells, meaning we could kill those cells at the time of injury and see if they're required for any aspect of recovery. So when we did that, um, we took animals and we did these, these, these memory tests on. 
And one way to do that in an animal is put them in what we call a Morris water maze, where um, animals, these animals don't like to be wet, and you put them in a little pool and make them swim. It's not very kind. Um, but they, you, you have ways to let them uh, get out of the water. It's a little hidden platform, and they keep swimming around in the pool till they find the platform, then they hop up on it. Um, and there's visual cues around. And you teach them how to do that, and then you take that um, platform away and see if they can remember where it was. And what we found, and I won't show you the details here, but in the animals where you have late neurogenesis, they can't remember that task at all. So if you keep intact this, what we call injury-induced neurogenesis, um, the animals are very robustly figure out how to, they remember where that goes. But if you take that response away, they don't. So the idea became that this is, this mediates some aspects of that self-recovery that occurs after brain injury. Now it's not all good, um, because um, many of you know, I'm sure, that one of the bad things that happens after brain injury sometimes is, is you can have a seizure and develop a seizure disorder. So one of the things we wanted to test was um, if you, um, give an animal a seizure disorder and you ablate neurogenesis at the same time using the same mouse model, it turns out that if you ablate neurogenesis at the time of a seizure, you don't develop a seizure disorder. Meaning that those newborn neurons might be mediating epilepsy. That's still, you know, we're still working on that, but it kind of gives us, there, there needs to be a balance there. So um, it potentially causes, can set you up for more seizures, but at the same time, it seems to be required for some of the learning and memory that happens after an injury. Um, these were kind of observations, but there was no mechanism kind of around it. We, were, we, we know these things occur, at least in our animal models, but we wanted to know some of the genes that might regulate this response. Um, so this was an experiment where we took those green cells I showed you and we took them from very young animals and we took them from older animals because they're when you're very young you have a ton of these these stem cells and when you're older you don't have as many so we took them both and we looked at what genes were being ex expressed in both populations well one of the most differentially expressed genes meaning um, a gene that was uh, very low um, in when there were lots of those cells, but became very high later on was ApoE. And the reason we were interested in ApoE um, was because in humans, um, there are different forms of ApoE that are very common. So we've known for a long time that the um, best kind of predictor of the development of late onset Alzheimer's disease is the presence of a form of this gene called ApoE4 that some of you may have heard of. Now it turns out that probably 25% of us in this room have at least one copy of ApoE4. So it's incredibly common. Um, and um, a few percentage of people will have two copies of E4, which turns out to be an even higher predictor of the development of Alzheimer's disease. And so, you know, one of the things is what does this have to do with traumatic brain injury? And it turns out if you have a traumatic brain injury, um, a severe one early in life, you do have a higher chance of developing Alzheimer's disease at some point. And this, this was actually just published um, in the last week or two. Um, but what it did is it took all the studies to see if there was any kind of an association with having ApoE4, that one that many of us have, and having an even worse outcome after a traumatic brain injury than you would have normally expect. And it turns out, looking at all of the studies, it turns out it does look like there's a an effect of ApoE4 on how you recover from a brain injury. So because we picked it out of the screen and we um, um, thought it might be important, at least in how humans recover from brain injury, we wanted to look at it in our newly born neurons. And this shows you if we, if we put viruses that express that, that green fluorescent protein I told you about, you um, can mark the whole neuron. You can't just see like, where one neuron's going, but you can see what that neuron looks like, and you can see, you can measure spine density and how sophisticated the neuron is. Um, and the reason we were interested in doing that is because we thought ApoE might be doing something to these newly born neurons.
And this just shows you that the APOE is primarily in astrocytes, and it's really, it, it, those, those dendrites are those newborn neurons. It's, it's kind of physically attached almost. And so you'd think it might be doing something. And so what one of the things we're working on now is taking mice that have, um, regular mice just have APOE. They don't have APOE4 and E2 and E3 like, like all of us do. But people have made mice that express those forms of APOE. And when we take those forms and we look at them, it turns out that APOE4 I told you about, which is, can be bad in humans, um, those mice don't have nearly as robust a neurogenic response after injury, meaning the neurons that are formed after injury, they're not as sophisticated um, and they don't have as many, they're, they have a much lower spine density, meaning they just don't work as well as the ones when there's just regular APOE. So that's kind of the connection we've made. Um, I'm gonna finish there. Um, I know it's, a, it's a, an awful lot of material to kind of summarize in 10 minutes and, and I've had a lot of help um, over the years with this, but um, we'll, um, I'll be happy to take questions after we kind of finish up here. So, thank you. My name is Lauren Oberlin. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Weill Cornell. And I just want to thank the organizers at Columbia Synapse. This is a wonderful initiative. I feel very thrilled to be here today. Um, so I'm also going to switch gears a little bit. My background is really in healthy and pathological aging. And given the lack of effectiveness of pharmaceutical treatments at addressing cognitive changes that occur with advancing age, a lot of work has focused on behavioral interventions for maximizing or optimizing aging trajectories. So I'm going to talk specifically about physical activity and brain health in late life, and also how some of this work could be applied to TBI. And first I want to mention um, the trajectory of cognitive change that takes place over the lifespan. So shown here on the x-axis is age from 25 to 88. And it shows within different cognitive domains the pattern of decline that takes place in healthy aging. So this is not in the context of a dementia. And we see so certain domains like language tend to get better over time. But most others like memory, visual spatial processing, and processing speed decline. And these changes become more precipitous as we reach our seventh or eighth decades of life. There are also age-related changes in um, brain structure. So shown here is a region that we've been talking about earlier, the hippocampus, and it shows across the lifespan on the x-axis the trend of atrophy in the hippocampus over time with more precipitous changes again taking place at the latter end of the um, lifespan. And to reiterate, the same we see the same pattern in white matter tissue as well, such that there are change, greater changes that take place in the latter end of the lifespan. And what I'm really interested in is individual differences in these trajectories. So you can see that those couple of people on the top that are in their 70s have a hippocampal volume that's pretty close to that of a 30-year-old, whereas um, the participant on the bottom is showing a greater, much greater magnitude of atrophy, again, in healthy aging. So what may contribute to differences in our aging trajectories? Um, now, physical activity has shown promise as a really accessible and low-cost treatment that may preserve cognitive abilities or reduce the risk of decline in older adulthood. So this has first was first looked at in healthy aging, and shown here are results from what's called a meta-analysis, which basically synthesizes data from multiple studies. And this represents data from 18 randomized controlled trials representing more than 800 older adults. And what they find is that exercisers demonstrated a significant increase in cognitive performance in multiple domains relative to control groups, and that the most robust findings were in the domain of executive function, which is kind of an umbrella term for lots of higher order cognitive processes like judgment and reasoning and decision 
So there are many other conditions that result in cognitive impairment. So what do we know about exercise effects in these groups? Can this approach be broadly applied? And so our group wanted to look at this in stroke survivors. And we again completed a meta-analysis where we compared outcomes um, across 14 randomized control trials and found that physical activity leads to co significant cognitive gains in stroke survivors, such that exercisers demonstrated significant gains in multiple cognitive domains relative to control groups. We also looked at um, the time frame in which exercise was initiated. And what we found was that exercise that was introduced in the chronic stroke phase, so specifically initiated more than three months post-stroke, resulted in positive treatment effects that were moderate in magnitude. And what's so meaningful here is that um, this really speaks to stroke survivors who have been struggling with cognitive impairment for a long time. And these folks um, in the kind of chronic stroke studies had experienced a stroke more than two and a half years prior to when they started exercising, and they still experienced cognitive impairment. And as many of us know, stroke can result in a lot of kind of um, adverse outcomes aside from cognitive deficits, and those include mobility limitations. So we looked at a subset of studies that only included folks that had mobility impairments like hemiparesis, and we found that those stroke survivors were able to participate in physical activity to the extent needed to induce cognitive gains. Um, so the, the um, evidence in older adults has been so compelling that in 2015, the Institute of Medicine identified physical activity as one of the most promising methods for improving cognitive function. And this approach, this kind of behavioral intervention has been more recently applied to a number of other populations that are susceptible to decline. So stroke survivors, as I mentioned, it's also been shown to improve cognitive performance in Alzheimer's, in individuals with Alzheimer's, and may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease in some prospective cohorts. Uh, improves cognition and Parkinson's disease, cancer survivors, and multiple sclerosis. And when I was doing the review that I just talked about, I initially wanted to do it in TBI. And when I looked at the literature, this was in 2017, there weren't there were like four papers looking at exercise effects in TBI in humans. Um, so I moved to stroke, which was also very interesting. But um, there hasn't been that. There's been surprisingly few studies looking at physical activity effects on cognition in traumatic brain injury, um, although this has changed in recent years. And now I know that I'm talking to a group full of neuroscientists, so I also want to mention and discuss some of the literature looking at exercise effects on brain health. And again, much of this work has focused on healthy aging. So shown here are results from a seminal study that came out in 2011. It was the first one to find this. And it looked at the effects of physical activity training 12 months of physical activity training in older adults on brain volume. And shown here in the blue line are exercisers, in the red line are controls, and as you can see, over the course of the intervention, there was an increase in hippocampal volume, while the control group demonstrated sort of normal age-related declines in the same way. Um, and this result, although this was the first paper to find this, has been shown dozens of times in lots of <coughs> other independent samples, so it's it's been very consistently confirmed. We're also interested in looking at not only gray matter, but also white matter tissue, which is so critical for the brain's ability to communicate with, uh, with um, various, within networks. And so we did this using um, an imaging approach called diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI, which allows us to look at the sort of infrastructure of white matter tissue. And what we found was that older adults with higher levels of cardiorespiratory fitness, so this is sort of a, this is an estimate of aerobic capacity, and it's sort of a proxy for sustained or habitual physical activity. So those with higher um, cardiorespiratory fitness had greater white matter integrity in a diverse network of white matter tracts, and specifically in inner hemispheric fibers and those that enable communication between subcortical and prefrontal structures. And we also know that um, in many ways, brain structures don't operate in isolation, that um, human brain function is shaped by interactions between brain regions through neural networks. So there are some novel imaging approaches that enable us to look at the synchronous activity between brain regions. 
Um, and so shown here are results from a study looking at the functional network connectivity or communication within meaningful brain networks. That includes the executive control network, the default mode network, and the dorsal attention network. And we know that these become more disrupted with advancing age. And so this study looked at about 400 people. And first, it just went, the authors looked at age-related differences. So in the kind of orangey bars are within each network, the degree or magnitude of functional connectivity in, in these um, different networks. And so you can see that the uh, younger population has the greatest degree of connectivity. Now then, they looked at high fit and low fit older adults, and that's in the teal and the blue. And they found that in the teal color are higher fit older adults that are similarly aged to the low fit older adults. And they exhibit functional connectivity strength or synchronous um, brain activation that is much closer in approximation to younger adults. So we're just beginning to understand the cellular and molecular mechanisms of exercise effects. And this primarily comes from very, very important and meaningful rodent work. Um, so one of the most consistent findings is that exercise engagement in rodents leads to an upregulation of trophic factors like BDNF and IGF, um, insulin-like growth factor one, which just enables things like neurogenesis, uh, induces angiogenesis or the growth of new blood vessels through the upregulation of proteins that are, have angiogenic effects. Um, promote synapti synaptogenesis as well as kind of structural changes, including increased dendritic outgrowth and dendritic complexity. Reduces chronic systemic inflammatory processes in the periphery and may also reduce sort of neurotoxic neuroinflammatory processes. Uh, has been shown in animal models to reduce amyloid deposition. This is one of the neural signatures of Alzheimer's disease. And it's also been shown in animal models to be neuroprotective against damage from stroke. So after inducing stroke, exercise engagement reduces um, lesion volume and also protects paralesional tissue from um, oxidative damage and kind of the neurotoxic effects of neuroinflammation. So hum there's been some human work trying to translate what we found in rodents and seeing if these kind of mechanisms are similar. And so what our lab has shown is that exercise-induced increases in hippocampal volume are mediated by increases in trophic factors in the periphery like BDNF. But I think that there's a lot of really cool, interesting work that can be done in the way of mechanisms and how to really apply this to individuals with acquired brain injury because, again, a lot of this rodent work has also been in models of healthy aging. So this is a cartoon from the New Yorker, I think, that came out in 2015. I've been working out for six months, but all my gains have been in cognitive function. I love this because <laughs> <laughs> I think as researchers, we really want our work to be translated to the people who it will benefit. So when I saw this cartoon, I was like, yes, someone, in, someone is reading this and making funny cartoons. That means that other people are going to learn about this, too. Um, that's it. Thank you. So, 
I think that the, the impact of exercise on heart health has been very well established and it's communicated really well in clinical settings. The cognitive aspect of that is not as, to my knowledge, is not as translated in clinical settings and in some ways, especially for aging populations, there's a lot of fear surrounding the prospect of cognitive decline. So that could be, if, if, if communicated more, um, more often and with more fervor, <laughs> that could, that aspect of physical activity effects could be um, really motivating for individuals. The other thing is I know for, for instance, with stroke survivors, there's often a hesitancy for practitioners to um, recommend physical activity because of mobility limitations and safety concerns. And what I wanna highlight is that all of these trials look very closely at what are called adverse events. So risk of injury by engaging in physical activity and what they find is that there really isn't any increased risk. There isn't any increased tendency for serious injury by even very recently after a stroke. Um, so I think maybe communicating that a little bit more and, and getting that information translated to clinical settings is interesting. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Noble, um, how has your clinical work and your research led you into any public health initiatives or kind of that scope of the issue? Yeah, I would say, uh, let me just follow up on one thing that you just said. So one of the other projects that I work on is something called Old School Hip Hop. Um, and we're right now teaching fourth and fifth graders about dementia in New York City. And one of the things that we teach them is all, not just recognition of things like Alzheimer's disease, but how do you keep your family healthy? So we don't ask them to go out and run a marathon, but to you know, be active with your grandparents. And it's, it really comes down to activity as a gateway towards more exercise uh, more formally. Um, as far as a public health initiative, I mean, that's one lens. So it's not just about learning about Alzheimer's disease, but how do you get people to come to the doctor to be more honest in their reporting? In the field of Alzheimer's disease, it's often delayed in, in recognition, same as it is in stroke. In the field of concussion, it's about uh, honesty and reporting. Uh, my work in, in public health has been really focused on a couple of different things. So uh, I talked about our work in the Big Ten and the Ivy League. This is not just about something you know offered to our students, but really trying to help the health and well-being of all of our students, and again, their students before they're athletes, um, across, across the consortium. Uh, some of my other work has uh, drawn from uh, looking at statewide concussion uh, care paradigm. So we looked actually at um, several million kids who had come to the emergency room for various things, including concussions, uh, New York statewide from 2005 to 2015. Looked at trends in care. Um, I work um, on a couple of different initiatives uh, in a, with a public health angle, including working with the Brain Injury Association of New York State, who are trying to put through a second version of this New York State law, which requires that if an athlete is removed from play, that they're assessed appropriately, and that they're cleared before the return, and that everybody on the sideline is, is concussion knowledgeable. Um, but what we've seen is that actually those laws may not make that much of a difference. It's really probably public perspective, uh, and part of it comes down to reporting. So right now there are no reporting requirements in most states, and so one of the things I've worked on has been a legislative initiative to try to get a second version through the New York State Legislature so that there's actually some follow-up that's been done on these concussions. That's interesting, thank you. Um, and Dr. Perry, you talked a lot about injury-induced neurogenesis. Um, so after uh, basically seeing these findings, how has this changed how we view and treat uh, TBI? Yeah, I think the most important thing we've learned is that uh, you know there is a lot of this spontaneous recovery that occurs and anything we can do to um, enhance kind of the, the processes that are happening anyway. Um, uh, I think, you know, Jamie alluded to it early on when he said, you know, even after concussions, there used to be this idea that you just kind of put people in a cocoon and you don't have them physically active and you don't have them stimulated. And that's turned out to be a bad thing. Intuitively, I, I mean, I can remember when that was, people were talking about, it, it never sounded intuitively like the right thing to do. Um, yet, the, it was happy because it's like you have an injury, you rest it. I think what we're learning, and it's not just about brain injuries, but all over medicine, is when you have an injury, you don't actually want to rest it. You, you want to keep, keep it challenged, you want to keep exercising it. You need to do it in a supervised manner. You, know, you, know, you don't want to push things too hard. Um, but it does go back to also, I mean, what Lauren was saying is 100% correct that um, the, the notion behind physical activity and cognitive health, I mean, the way she showed that any kind of uh, essentially um, 
anything that impacts cognition, whether it's aging or stroke or TBI, um, all of those things, um, um, kind of the, the downhill decline can be attenuated by exercise. And we know from the injury-induced neurogenesis um, uh, that uh, um, exercise is one of the things that we know in animal models. It's, it's hard to look at in humans. You can really just look at hippocampal volume, um, like Lauren was saying, but in animal models, exercise is the most potent stimulator of neurogenesis that we know. Also, a quick thing to anyone um, considering kind of uh, the research aspect, you started out in research. Um, how do you account for diversity in TBI, such as varying symptoms or responses to certain treatments? Um, does that occur often? Um, and can you adjust, uh, for example, like models based on animals to a diversity that occurs in humans? I'll, I'll just take that one for now, <laughs> just because I think one of the reasons I started studying. Um, uh, TBI. So this was 20 some years ago. I was in the pediatric ICU, and I, what mostly you see in the pediatric ICU is things that I call acquired injuries. So injuries like TBI or like hypoxic ischemic brain injuries from lack of oxygen. Um, and I wasn't as interested in genetic diseases because they were very rare. What we're learning now is that genetic diseases are not rare. Essentially, all of us have genetic kind of um, signatures that affect how we respond to an injury. And so I show you the one example of APOE. Um, it's the most obvious one we've learned, but we're learning there are many, many, many more. And so I think the heterogeneity, it's not all about genetics. Um, there are a lot of experience things. It's, there are many things involved, but I think only now we're getting the ability to, um, um, to try to take these very heterogeneous diseases and put them in relatively more defined categories. One of the things that I did not show you that's very discouraging, if you look at the, at the severe TBI literature, there have been, I've got one slide I'd like to show people, that there have been nearly 100,000 people enrolled in studies involving TBI and TBI treatments. None of them have done anything to really improve um, our knowledge about how to improve things after TBI. It's not none of them, but it's the vast majority of them have either been negative or just show very marginal changes. One of the reasons I believe behind that is we try to lump these things together. We try to make what is a very heterogeneous disease and heterogeneous people and kind of categorize them as the same and treat them the same. And now we're starting to learn that, that you gotta take every individual separately or at least try to lump them in the much smaller categories. And I think that's where we're really gonna see some more positive outcomes to these kinds of trials. And I would say from a human perspective, uh, thinking about sports-related concussions, we, we don't necessarily have the power to look at genetic factors until um, you know, we have a very large sample size. So if you're thinking about clinical factors, the ones that are associated with concussion risk or delayed recovery are things like, or at least have been proposed, to be things like learning disabilities, migraine, seizure history, mood disorder, and prior history of traumatic brain injury. Uh, while we have the benefit of having a relatively, you know, kind of a well-circumscribed population in, in collegiate athletics, we don't have generally people, at least in the Ivy League, who have learning disabilities. There are very few people who have epilepsy, who have, um, who have concussion or you know, play contact sports. So we select against, um, just by the nature of the sports themselves, the, the, an opportunity for looking at some of these factors. But we just have to be mindful of the population that we study, what are we actually able to, to explore um, and, and how can we do that? So it's not to say that it's it's all for, uh, you know, it's, it's a lost opportunity, but we really just have to realize, well, there are certain limitations with whatever population we study. Uh, much as, you know, Lauren's studying older persons, I'm studying younger persons, but I'm also doing that through the lens of being a dementia specialist, too, and, and thinking about cognitive outcomes that are similar to Sure. Um, and so, Dr. Oberlin, do you think that um, the concussion effects of certain brain injuries and uh, like how traumatic they may be can affect, um, or rather have an effect on how um, how best exercise can um, aid kind of recovery? That's a really thoughtful question and one that I don't know, I don't think that there's empirical um, data on just yet. I, so when we're, so exercise has been assessed in multiple different populations, healthy aging. So their brains are pretty intact. 
relative to pathological aging, so someone with a neurodegenerative condition. And there's been some work comparing the effect size of exercise across these populations. It's possible that those with a greater degree or magnitude of injury could reap the biggest benefit from an exercise intervention. Um, so it's, it's I, we don't know the answer to that yet. I think that's critically important, and, and your point about the, the heterogeneity of TBI is critical. It's, it's, this is something that I see in, in dementia, because there's lots of dementia subtypes. So what was a problem for a while were people were just saying, I'm gonna explore X in dementia and just like recruiting everyone who had some type of dementia without really thinking about how much these things differ um, and how, how much the etiologies differ and the severity and the progression. And so with TBI, there are different grades and different degrees, and if we're recruiting people with mild, moderate, and severe, and treating them all as the same, as having the same presentation in the same model, that it's going to be, it's really gonna dilute any, any effects we might see, because of course, severity is gonna be a really big part of this. Okay, um, and then also, just to gain some insight into like, how the field operates, um, you each mentioned like certain collaborations are really a team of people that you work with. How do you manage um, like collaborating with either other individuals or um, neuroscientists or really institutions? How does that work? It, it usually is just, you know, some of it kind of just comes up organically as you, um, you meet people. Um, that's why there are, you know, it's why there are meetings of people who have some kind of common interest. It's why we give presentations like this. And then, um, uh, you'll, you'll make introductions um, that go across. Sometimes they happen uh, um, uh, through, you know, through a little bit of serendipity. Interestingly for me, how I met Jane, even though we're physicians at uh, Columbia, at the medical center, we met through our collaborator, Barton Morrison, who's in bioengineering here. Um, and we both started working with him independently and then met each other. And so a lot of it is just, it's just kind of finding people with common interests and, um, and then overlapping and writing grants together and working on projects together. Um, and uh, um, it's really, it's really um, about aligning interests. Yeah, I think, I think the key lesson here is that you can't do it alone. Um, nobody has all of this, all of the necessary skill sets. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the example of, um, uh, of the, the pencil in economics, right? There's no, there's no one person who can make a pencil, grow, grow the tree, make the paint, you know, mine the lead, make the eraser, those kind of things. It's the same kind of thing in science. Um, and, and I agree with Steve, the, the relationships I have with researchers here sometimes are more obvious when they're within your division. Sometimes you have to find people that do not have the necessary skill set. Sometimes you look within your institution. We're blessed by having so many people in our institution at so many, you know, a wide array of skill sets. But at the same time, you often end up making collaborative networks um, out of the need, of uh, different needs. So maybe we have all the biostatistical bio support that we need here, but you need, you need individuals to study. Um, you know, a population, and uh, you often can't do that alone. As I said, you know, 2,000 or, you know, 2,000 athletes sounds like a great number, but if 90 or 80 percent of those people are recovering within two to three weeks, I'm really only interested in probably the 40 or 50 people that aren't recovering quickly out of those 2,000. So very quickly you run, you run out, of, um, out of the ability to kind of look at these individual factors that you're interested in. As an example for genetic factors, you can look at specific genetic factors that you hypothesize are going to be related. But if you want to discover new ones, you're looking at probably needing 10,000 individuals with a, with a condition. Obviously, you can't do that alone. So that's how these networks uh, develop. And the NIH, which is the main funding organization here in the United States, it's a federal funding organization, has had a specific initiative for collaborative network development and sharing of data and, and resources as early as possible, as soon as uh, data is generated. Most federally funded data has to be shared. Uh, and, and this is part of that initiative for uh, not just uh, you know, developing collaborative networks, but really making important discoveries for, for group care. If I can just add to that really quickly, I see a lot of young faces in the room, obviously people here are interested in research. If I would just recommend, if you go to a talk that you like, if you have a professor that you like, it's never annoying to go up and say, I'm fascinated by your work. I think this is really compelling. How can I get involved? How can I learn more? People love to talk about their own research. They do, because it's <laughs> cool and we're passionate about it. Um, 
So if something really speaks to you or strikes you, please feel comfortable approaching people because maybe if they don't need help in their lab, they can say, well, my colleague though is just, is doing X, maybe you'd be interested in that. So um, any opportunity you have to talk to someone that, um, that does work that you are passionate about and driven by in some way, I would just take it. And this was something that came up in preparation for this talk about uh, something that I brought up is, you know, I don't know, Steve and Lauren, you probably have the same, same experience where you have a, a people reaching out to you all the time, uh, you know, looking to work with you, and, and sometimes you'll be able to, you know, meet with that person or set up a time to meet with them during office hours. And for those of you that's just getting started, um, you know, we take meetings all the time. We don't take offense if something doesn't work out. People are sure trying to figure out what they want to do. But I would encourage you to follow through if you don't want to work with that person to say, you know what, uh, just want to make sure you, you heard. Cause, you know, we'll, we won't take any offense, but I found something else to do, but I don't want to leave you hanging. Um, I, I, that's one pet peeve of mine for, for uh, people coming to work with me is I take a lot of meetings, and it's very infrequent that I hear people who let me know that they don't want to work with me. I think they're a little bashful about saying I really don't want to work with that. That's fine. I actually I would prefer to not to know that you don't want to, so I can move on. So a lot of times I'll have kind of like a project in mind that oh this person approached me and I kind of earmarked it for that person, uh, but all too often I don't hear back from that person. I just don't have a bandwidth to track down that email and figure out who that person was. Great. Um, I think we can open up for discussion to the out about exercise. Um, you know, the media is a very good venue, but you have to get the, um, the right delivery. And we have agencies that sell products, and you have to get someone who's passionate about um, helping people who can find a venue through which they could then marching for hearts, for cancer, but you don't see people marching for TBIs. So maybe that's the venue. But getting back to having a TBI, I noticed that I've had several over the years, but one was very instrumental in um, reducing my abilities. Uh, resilience is the main factor. Um, I am a stubborn person and I will find doors to open. And there are many people who don't, who don't have that. Uh, um, and when you get a TBI, you lose so much of yourself. So I think there should be a collaborative effort between TBI and some psychotherapy. Not that you become mentally ill, but you have to accept something that dramatically changes you which is so hard to do. You look in the mirror and you don't see yourself and you say, who is this person? And you just become angry. So I think there has to be some overlap with other uh, agencies to get the word out and to help people with TBI. Agreed, thank you. Um, and this is not in response to the previous comment, but just something I forgot to mention earlier. Um, we asked about if there are any like um, personal stories um, that those could be addressed afterwards um, if the researchers and physicians are, not, are able to speak. Um, but we want to keep this general that um, and keep comments that, uh, that can benefit everyone in the room. I, I do want to just, um, I think this is a really important point. Um, and especially we know with, with moderate to severe TBIs that mood disorders um, are more frequent. So it, it is a critical component, and you know, if someone's depressed following TBI, I mean, maybe that's motivated to participate in other beneficial activities or kind of like rehabilitation approaches. So I, I, I guess I just want to say that I totally agree. I appreciate your comment a lot. And um, there are, so I know, I just finished up my internship at NYU, Russ, and they have a program that's specifically integrated for people who have had a TBI or a stroke 
and it's receiving psychotherapy. Um, it has group treatment and individual treatment, so I think there is an increased awareness, um, but it's not it's not been fully integrated into medical systems across the board. And benefited from that program. Okay. Sure. Great. Advertise. <laughs> um, sure, go ahead. Hi. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm a freshman in Columbia College. I'd like to thank the initiative and thank you all to come down here and present your research. Uh, this is a question for you. Uh, I think you used some optogenetic techniques in your research, right? No, actually. It's not optogenetic? It was not. It, oh, all, it seems They're like all genetic drug based. Similar idea, but. But do you think uh, one day it will be possible to apply that to the human brain for research? Um, so, what he's alluding to is um, optogenetics is this technique that you can do in mice where you basically make some transgenic mice like we did, but then you can have ways of turning on and off neurons um, uh, selectively with optogenetics. It's called optogenetics because you can use light to do it with these implanted, um, implanted electrodes. I think optogenetics per se is not, it's a great research tool, won't be probably ever a clinical tool, mainly because of the difficulty of making kind of transgenic responsiveness that is light dependent. Um, what I do think, though, is that the ability to, um, um, to manipulate certain areas of the brain that are most affected, and um, for instance, if there's a seizure disorder, being able to silence just a particular area using very targeted type therapies that are related to something like that, I think that's... Um, <coughs> I think right now, unfortunately, most of our brain treatments, they, they affect the entire brain. So like I mentioned to you where you could have the neurogenesis, it could cause seizures, yet it could also improve cognitive outcome. I think our ability to define those treatments to just the particular parts of the brain that are most effective is where we'll see improvements going forward. And for those of you who are interested in, 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 in studying neuroscience and, and ultimately making it a part of your career, I think it, it, that's I think we're at such an exciting time um, because a lot of these techniques that were that look super cool in animals um, are now just getting to where we can start thinking about how we can use them therapeutically. Yeah, thank you very much. That's been very inspirational. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm um, Such a beautiful question, and I actually know the answer. <laughs> um, so actually our control groups are, like when I was talking about controls, that those comprise of stretching and toning, not aerobic exercise. We like those sort of controls because there's still the social component, there's still the group component, and there's some kind of movement involved. But aerobic exercise, it, it kind of initiates different mechanisms, and what we see is aerobic has a greater effect than non aerobic, but the combined is the ticket. That is where we see the greatest magnitude of gains. Um, yeah, so that both in terms of brain stuff and cognitive stuff. Well, I'm grappling with all the specifics of this. I wanted to, the more active my students become, whether it's uh, sitting and thinking or the exercise, the worse some of my symptoms become. So it's a trade off, it's a cruel joke, but it's the reality I have to face. You know, so I want the benefits, but I don't want them. The side effects, but I do get them. Whether I like it or not. Yeah. Have you had patients that have been, had that kind of effect? That are more active, they are physically the worst on symptomatically they can get. So I, I think it, I, it would depend symptomatically what you mean. So some people feel fatigued after exercising, mm -hmm. and some people feel energized actually. But um, so, it, are there specific things that you've noticed? Static in my brain. Oh. I had uh, hallucinations. I see. And uh, I could go on the comorbidity goes off <laughs> <laughs> charts, unfortunately. Okay. But, um, I experienced very strong 
feelings of static in my head. Mm -hmm. So I hold exercise and if I'm on the computer. For uh, like cognitive activity. Oh. Well, there is um, there's kind of a concept that's used clinically called neuro fatigue, where like if you're if you probably heard about stress, <laughs> that um, I say something. She after she was nine, I don't have the same, uh, I call it, brain energy that I had before. So I learned that I allocated, because if I put so much here, and so much here, and so much here, break it up with rests in between, and don't overextend myself, I get banged in the buck. So you may be, you may be trying to get, you know, bang for the, the back. I don't try for the whole back. I just try for the box. You mentioned the frustration. I've been exercising for 60 years about that rate. So yeah. it, it is tough to accommodate to what I am now yeah. compared to what I, I That sort of adjustment can be really challenging. My, it may be that maybe breaking it up, you may, you know, half an hour a couple times over the course of a day rather than two consecutive hours may reduce, but we can also talk more after if you'd like. I'd yeah. say that general concept yeah. that comes up a lot in individuals, especially those facing concussion in young life, either as athletes or in young professionals and, and really in all phases of life, are basically there are two parallel processes that happen when, when people are recovering after concussion. So there's the physiologic brain recovery that takes, takes place on its kind of its own time. Maybe it's hastened by, by exercise. But then there's also the psychological component where people feel really disabled if they're unable to do the things that they want to do on the timeline that they expect. Yeah. Traumatic brain injury has its own timeline. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we often emphasize with our athletes is that if you feel symptomatic, it's probably not hurting your brain. We have no evidence to support that it is. But it certainly can be psychologically harmful if you feel like, I ought to be able to run three miles, I was doing that two weeks ago. But if you reassure people that you will get there, it's going to take that time, but you will get there. That often is the way to kind of help you know, uh, people navigate those recovery path uh, pathways. It often comes up also in people who are feeling like, you know, I'm supposed to be you know, making dinner, putting the kids to bed, getting up and going to work, you know, going to class, whatever phase of life those kind of social and academic and professional um, strains are, are felt, those are the times where it often comes about. But again, it's not so much that it's harmful, but some of the techniques you talked about kind of taking breaks, um, you might be able to accomplish nearly as much but with, uh, without as many symptoms. Um, yes. Hi. Um, I just have two uh, questions or comments. Um, my first is that I was really, I guess, surprised that really the only solution or rehabilitation mechanism that you talked about was exercise. Because I know that from having a lot of contact, you know, with people with, with brain injury in between, like vestibular issues and other issues, and just and fatigue, and also unable, unable to function, whether it's executive function, memory and other issues like that like exercise is not gonna i mean may age you know your recovery but it's certainly not gonna make like the rehabilitation happen so i'm really surprised that that was really the only kind of really just rehabilitation mechanism that you well, discussed i think and it was based on just the interest of time but i did have it on my slide it kind of went by quickly but it was about supporting the non-brain or the non-cognitive associated symptoms mm -hmm. that accompany traumatic brain injury including cervical spinal injury vestibular injuries um, so it, it, it was simply for the, for the idea of the talk, not to, not to, dis, not to uh, diminish the importance of those things. But those are, you know, a, a traumatic brain injury is not just about the brain injury, it's about all the other injuries that accompany it. But you're absolutely right that it's a multimodal therapy that comes along with it. Um, yeah. you know, I, I think, you know, when getting to vision therapy, vestibular therapy, I think there's a recognition that the trial data that we have to support its use is, is pretty weak. Uh, on the other hand, there seems to be a little downside to using it. A lot of people. Cognitive therapy, the neuropsychology. I didn't get to that yet, but yeah, no, all those things. They, the, the data seems to be, you know, mixed. Uh, probably a little downside to doing them, and a lot of people trying to find benefit from them. Um, the uh, and, and for that reason, we recommend them. Um, I think the the bigger question comes up a lot is, you know, are there any medications uh, or nutraceuticals that can be used to hasten recovery? And that's where we really have hardly any data uh, to support their use. On the other hand, for people who have things like migraine or post-traumatic headaches, we treat them as though they have post-traumatic migraines, being mindful of medications that might cause side effects, cognitive side effects, especially. 
in that case, you know, yes, all those things like riboflavin or, or uh, coenzyme Q, which are very good in, in migraine, especially pediatric migraine, may have some role in post-traumatic uh, headaches as well. So no, it was not, not to belittle those at all, it's just a matter of the focus of health. Um, and the other, um, so you're talking about the first parent and that kind of thing, but I'm um, the policy and advocacy director for the organization called Pain Concussion. It does advocacy research awareness, and we've had conferences from uh, Sinai, NYU, VA hospitals, the NIH, um, and in the World Conference of Brain Injury in Toronto, really to just um, recognize the fact that there's been a lack of research of awareness of education of advocacy really on the impact of girls and women, whether that's in sports, that's in the military, that's from domestic violence, that's from assault. And I think all of that really needs to be integrated into, into, the, into the conversation. And at the NIH, after a couple of years of you know, discussing with them, finally we did a conference on that. We opened up the first brain bank for donations for women's brain, and we also have one joint with Sinai as well. So I just wanted to, I guess, you know, and for children at Boston Children's Hospital, we talked about the impact of hormones and development you know, and how that impacts, you know, just your menstruation and all that. And I think that that, you know, all is just something that really needs to be, you know, integrated into the conversation. Yeah, I would just say that because this is something front and center here. I mean, our first publication that we had out of the Columbia uh, Concussion Program was focused specifically on sex-based differences in concussion expression. Um, if you tuned in uh, just Wednesday and Thursday this week, there was a two-day symposium on the next uh, NIH criteria for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And a lot of time was spent talking about how do we how do we uh, get a better sense of what brains look like across the lifespan, and especially um, in, among youth and especially among women. And there were several hours of discussion focused on um, you know, the, the potential opportunities for enrolling, uh, you know, autopsy-based studies of things like the medical ex the medical examiner for New York City was there. So the, the, the person doing the brain autopsies is on that panel. So I can I can assure you that this is something that's front and center for everybody, but it's not always easy. You know, I think uh, that's a great question. And for all that we've done to improve awareness and educational outreach, every, for example, every edu every college student in America has to be educated about uh, concussion. Most state laws require that. But knowledge does not translate always to attitudes, does not always translate to behavior. And this is a huge issue in the field of concussion. I haven't been in this field that long, but I've seen a pendulum swing back where I think Athletes are more prone to hiding it now. Um, I, I do think at some point, um, concussion may become a metric of honesty in certain sports, where it almost is an inevitable consequence of being a you know, participant in a certain sport for a certain period of time, certainly the high-risk sports being among them. Um, you know, culture is, is tough to change. If we try to you know, espouse what's right from the standpoint of the physicians, the athletic trainers, um, but sometimes it comes from, from the, the athletes themselves, and a lot of times that's where it starts. Um, we were talking earlier, so I mentioned this old school hip hop program where we'll be teaching fourth and fifth graders. We have um, an idea about maybe starting something like that around concussion, but when is the time, when, when, when is the time right for really teaching young kids about concussion? Is it before they have their first exposure? Is it as they're getting into sports? Um, and how do we change that culture? Uh, I think it probably, um, is, is inclusive of parents who are often driving a lot of these discussions, but also the kids uh, at a time where they're starting to get into these very competitive levels uh, for reporting. But, and I agree with everything that you said, but part of it is that you, you can't ever trust an adolescent. Um, and you know, they, you can't trust an adolescent. And so when they come into the hospital, if, I'm, if they come in for whatever reason in the ICU, I do a drug screen, I do a pregnancy test, I do all of these things, for behaviors they deny. Um, but one of the problems with concussion and brain injury is there is no test, right? There's no biomarker. And so a lot of the research has really been directed towards identifying biomarkers that can tell you 
whether it's like a drug test, whether they have had an injury, um, whether they'll admit to it or not. Um, and, I, and, and honestly, I think we're not, we're only going to be so successful in changing culture and behavior, particularly with an adolescent brain. They're just not wired all that, all that great for making good decisions. Mm -hmm. several devices that are coming online that are looking at eye movements right. as a means for helping to detect right. concussion. But as was said earlier, it's concussion is not just about brain injury and we can see, I mean, there are basically three broad networks that we see affected in concussion and we can detect them in different ways. So there are vestibular ocular, which can manifest from either eye movements or abnormalities or balance changes. The vision system for both acuity and perception is broadly connected in the brain and can be affected and also our cognitive um, cognitive changes. And so there are automated devices that are trying to detect eye movements really as a means for either picking up something that the doctor can't see or really making it so that it doesn't matter who's doing the examination, there's something detected. And the same thing has been looked at. Um, you, know, you, can, you can identify concussion in the locker room on the sideline pretty easily from a clinical examination and these tools can help us refine that maybe a, a small proportion of the time. But it's really, these tools will probably be more helpful in prognostication or as I was working on in this device in early detection before the athlete has time to hide it. All right, great. Thank you guys so much for being here. And also thank you, Dr. Colton, Dr. Ozil, and Dr. Noble for taking a question. A very important issue. And as Dr. Noble said, like when it comes to awareness about brain injury and concussion, it's about changing the culture around like talking about them, right? And um, just like that, Columbia Synapse is just like one step in the movement, just like their work is one step in the movement in talking about and finding out about these issues. So thank you for being good allies and being here today to learn about brain injury, and I hope you guys can come to future Synapse events too. Thank you. And